Welcome. We're glad that you joined us tonight. We have a man from Boise, Idaho, that belongs to the Masonic Lodge. And uh, he's going to be our guest on the program. He actually wrote to me and said that he objected to some things that we have said on a prior program. And I thought that might make an interesting program for everybody. And so Bill Mankin, who is also a Christian in Boise, uh, Bill, we're glad that you're here tonight. He's a 32nd degree Mason in the Lodge in Boise. And uh, right next to him is Dr. Walter Martin. Most of you folks are familiar with Dr. Martin. He's the director and founder of the Christian Research Institute. He's also the uh, distinguished professor of comparative religions at Simon Greenleaf School of Law. And uh, Dr. Martin, we're glad that you're here tonight. Bill, I think I'm going to come right to you because you wrote the letter and you sent it to me, but it was actually addressed to Walter. And I thought, uh, instead of me setting the discussion tonight, why don't you tell the guy right next to you, right to his face, what you objected to, <laughs> what you objected to that he said on one of our programs. Uh, about last January, I believe, you did a series of programs on Mormonism. And uh, the upshot of it was towards the end of, of the discussion. Uh, there was a remark from Do Dr. Martin that this all stemmed from the cult of Freemasonry. And my specific objection was to the use of the term cult on what I had always termed a, a fraternal organization that uses certain symbols. Uh, masonry, strictly defined, is a, our definition is a system of allegory, or excuse me, a system of morality veiled in allegory and in and illustrated by symbols. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, we don't function as a religion. It's a fraternal organization. And as such, uh, I objected to the use of the term cult. And that is, in essence, the subject of my letter to Dr. Martin, of which you did indeed get a copy. Okay. Walter, how in the world could you say a system of morality veiled in allegory is a cult? Well, the dictionary definition of a cult from the Latin cultus is that a, a group of individuals uh, devoted to a specific idea or individual, gathered around that individual, or a set of rites or rituals um, qualifies as a cult. Uh, there are five different definitions given, and uh, I was speaking in the functional definition of masonry, which is that masonry actually is a substitute faith and a very real religion and a rival of Christianity, even though uh, it largely, in its vocabulary, uh, projects itself as a fraternal organization. Also, I think that there are many Masons who are in the Masonic Order, my father having been one of them, uh, who are very devoted to the uh, noble ideas of promoting hospitals, uh, caring for the sick and the aged, uh, the charitable works of Masonry, uh, there was no quarrel with that at all in my upbringing or my thinking, and I observed it in my own father. Um, but that, of course, has nothing to do with individual salvation, because in Christianity, salvation is by grace alone through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and has nothing whatever to do with uh, you working your way to heaven by any means, whatever. And I think we've got to stop here. I think, Bill, you are a Christian, aren't you? <laughs> yes, sir. And yeah. so that you're, you are, you've got two fellow Christians sitting there, and I think the point of our program is is Christianity compatible with the Lodge? And you are saying basically that it is. Certainly. Now, I'd like to, let me preface this, because uh, there are many good things with the Lodge in terms of what Walter just mentioned, the hospitals and so on, the different functions, the charities. And I think that uh, there's no argument on that. Uh, we never argue with people that, on things that are, are right. But the, the discussion comes around. Let me see if I can frame it for you. And that is that uh, it's not a religion. More than that. It's not a religion. It, is, it offers no system of salvation. And I'm going to have to read uh, uh, from this certain point because this is very, very important and something that you should realize because uh, we have none of the marks of a religion. Okay, let, okay? Her, let her go. Right. We have no creed, no confession of faith in a doctrinal statement. We have no theology. We have no ritual of worship. We have no symbols that are religious in the sense of symbols found in a church or a synagogue. Our symbols are related to the development of character of the relationship of man to man. 
They are working tools to be used in the building of life. Okay. These working tools have been used from time immemorial to build buildings. Okay. And all we are saying is that, that if you as an individual adopt the principles represented, and we'll get into some of that symbol, symbolism later on, that you will be a better person. Not that you're going to go to heaven. Okay. But I, I, I have uh, uh, taken this from the state of Tennessee. This is the Tennessee Craftsman, the monitorial work. Uh, for the state of Tennessee, for the lodge, okay. okay? Now, in the one that I'm holding right here, I've got the whole book with me, is that uh, there are prayers at the front that uh, are used as examples to open up the meetings of the lodge and, and so on to close, I suspect, the meetings of the lodge. Would you agree with this prayer? Number one, this is the first one on the page here, okay? Most merciful God, supreme architect of heaven and earth, we beseech thee to guide and protect these brethren here assembled and fulfill at this time that divine promise. Bless and prosper us in all our laudable undertakings and grant, O God, that our conduct may tend to thy glory, to the advancement of Freemasonry, and finally to our own salvation in that blessed kingdom where the righteous shall find rest. Okay. You like, do you agree with that prayer? Uh, it's one thing we have to realize here is that I have to speak to you as an Idaho Mason. We don't use that prayer in I Idaho, know. and I'll be happy to, to give you the one that we do use. Each jurisdiction has its own uh, uh, ritual, okay. and, and although say, it, it, varies, you, it varies in principle. Would you agree with that? Uh, I see nothing wrong with it in context, in the context of, of the great architect of the universe. Ours says, right. uh, in thy name we desire to proceed in all our doings. Uh, it's, it, in an essence, you're saying the same thing. Wouldn't you say, though, that a prayer addressed to most merciful God, supreme architect of heaven and earth, and that our conduct may, our conduct may tend to thy glory and finally to our own salvation, isn't that religious? Uh, as religious says, the prayer that prefaces uh, uh, each opening of the Congress of the United States. Okay, but uh, uh, is then... Uh, our conduct as a Christian, just take these lines, is our conduct may tend... Uh, I don't think it says Christian in there. I don't think it does either. That's what <laughs> I'm getting to. Our conduct uh, may tend to uh, finally give us our own salvation in that blessed kingdom. Uh, aren't we talking about salvation here? They might be. Uh, but here again, you come back to... you come back to. We're going to talk about this all night long. You're talking okay, about something that is... I just want, to, I just want to follow is, through on the first prayer I got in the book right that, here in our own state. That is symbolic. It is symbolic in nature. We are not offering a system of salvation. We are not. Well, if we're asking God to help us in our conduct so we can finally get our own salvation, I would say that's a pretty solid piece of religion. Can I read you a prayer? Yeah. Okay. I got this out of the Sonic Library. As we lift up our heads, our Father... May we also open the doors of our hearts that the glory of thy spirit may come in and dwell with us, helping us to render a true service to thee and a faithful service to the fellow men working under the banner of truth, justice, and love. May we lead our people beyond the limits of differences and divisions to the heights of unity and peace. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Okay. In order for us to define terms, because uh, the questions I'm going to ask you on the two prayers that we've read have to do with how... What, what God are we talking about? Who is the great architect, the supreme architect of the universe? Okay? Now, how do, we, how do we figure that out? What is your authority? When you have a question on the Masonic Lodge, who do you go to? I go to the ritual. And where does the ritual come from? Uh, the ritual is, is that's, that's the portion. The monitor portion of the ritual is, is spoken. What deals with the obligation and the doings of Masonry is the portion that is secret. That, and, and unfortunately... Uh, uh, you're not privy to that unless you ask to be privy to it. Did the, did the, did the branch in Idaho originate there in a vacuum? No. You, you will Is receive a, a dispensation from another lodge to, to uh, conduct it, proceedings. where did it all go back to? It all comes back to the Grand, Grand Lodge of England in 1717. Okay. And when it came to America, where did it come to first in America? Uh, i got to look. Where, where's the home base? The, the there is no home base. Okay. Uh, when it came in and George Washington was a part of it and uh, Jefferson and so on, uh, must have been up there in the eastern states. Uh, you have the Grand Lodge now in every state, is that correct? That is correct. Okay, now the Grand Lodge for uh, Idaho is what? Is that yours? That's, that's, that is our jurisdiction. Okay, so do you have connection in 
Is there a fraternal organization in the sense that you agree with the beliefs of some of these other organizations, these other states? The basic philosophy of Masonry. So would Philadelphia be that much different from Idaho? Uh, not in content. Would New York be that much different from Idaho? Not in content. Okay. Now let me ask you this. Not in principle, I should say. All right. Uh, occasionally in content. Let me ask you this. In terms of authorities, uh, let me just ask you a couple here. Right in my hands I have a new encyclopedia of Freemasonry. Do you accept uh, what Arthur Edward Waite has uh, written in here? I, I have not read that. Okay. This was put out now, uh, as far as I know, in uh, 82. And uh, here you have the Encyclopedia of Masonry. Here is the, the meaning of masonry, masonry by W.L. Wilmhurst. Um, he is authored, this is, he is listed in the Encyclopedia Britannica, is one of the chief Masonic writers in English masonry. Okay, it was reprinted by command of uh, by command of uh, the folks, uh, the Grand Lodge of New York, and the curator and the librarian had this republished to set forth the meaning of masonry. Okay, okay. would you accept that? I, I will accept that as okay. opinion. All right, not as an official doctrine of okay. masonry. How about Duncan's Ritual of Freemasonry? I'm not familiar with the book. I don't. This is just the basic uh, manual, it says, to uh, the three symbolic degrees the, of uh, ancient York Rite. Um, just seems like it has the basic uh, outline. Uh, seems like it's found in every uh, lodge that uh, uh, I've well, ever asked. And there again, John, you're going to run into these situations where, okay. where that's not necessarily true. Okay. As I said, the work varies from state to state. All right. But uh, how about uh, then... Uh, uh, when we asked of uh, two lodges, uh, one in Philadelphia, the Grand Lodge there, we asked, uh, who would you recommend that would give an authoritative account or would give the best account of masonry? And they gave us uh, the Encyclopedia of uh, Freemasonry by Mackey. Hi, Mackey. Okay, you're acquainted with that. Yes, sir. Would you say that's a good representation? I would say that's a good representation of most of what masonry is about. Good. But it is still Mackey's opinion, and that's what we're involved in. Okay. Uh, and finally, how about, uh, I would say, most of the people that are part of the Lodge are familiar with uh, Morals and Dogma of Freemasonry by Albert Pike. Albert Pike specifically <coughs> directs, there are, there's a very small portion of the book that, that speaks to the first three degrees or Blue Lodge Masonry. The balance of that book and, the, and by far the lion's share speaks to the fourth through thirty-second degrees. Okay. You're, you're familiar with the fact that the very phrase that you used in your letter to me comes from Albert Pike's book. Uh, the, the, the definition of masonry is, is pretty much universal. Okay. I can show you another one that All came from right. the I German wanna, handbook I just want that to says essentially the same thing. I just want to suggest that uh, we've done our homework in terms of trying to define the words as is not presented by Ankerberg or Martin or anybody else, but what people that are in the lodges, what they are saying, this is the best we've got in terms of representing us. As long as you deal with it in the terms of symbolism and allegory, you'll get no argument from me. Okay. Uh, Dr. Martin, you want to pick it up there in terms of uh, these prayers then? I think that we should cut through this one important language barrier, which we have right now. And that is that whatever source you quote, our brother's going to say, that's not authoritative if it disagrees with what he thinks. That's true. Therefore, the inevitable court of appeal is what he thinks and not what any Masonic authority writes. Would you say that's true? Uh, no, Dr. Martin, I don't, I don't say that's true. Well, I, I mean, no, I mean uh, John was very careful uh, to give you uh, the outstanding authorities on the subject, and you said yes. Uh, Insofar as, insofar as, I and, but now what, what is the insofar? I didn't say that as regards to the Tennessee uh, Monitor. That's an actual document used in well, Lodge. Well, let's take the other ones then. But Mackey, but Mackey and, is not. Mackey is not used in Lodge anywhere. It's oh, opinion. Okay, okay, I'm just saying, I mean, I'm trying to get down to the bedrock of this thing, okay? The bedrock is uh, the authoritative source in Masonry for you is what you read yourself and deduce from it and believe. No, the, the authoritative uh, source for masonry is the ritual. The ritual, what happens in the lodge, so, what goes on. All right, so there are some basic things then that are universal to masonry. Yes. And that you would agree with and that all masons would agree with. Yes. 
Okay, now we have established that there is a basic foundation upon which all masonry rests, all right? Mm -hmm. All right, now let me go to some of these and, and find out if this is accurate. Um, quote, Masonry reverences all the great reformers. It sees in Moses, the lawgiver to the Jews, in Confucius and Zoroaster, in Jesus of Nazareth, in the Ara Arabian iconoclast, great teachers of morality and eminent reformers, if no more, and allows every brother of the order to assign to each such higher and even divine characteristics as his creed and truth require. Close quote. Now, I'm a Muslim, a Jew, a Buddhist, a Confucianist, a Zoroastrianist, and I reject Jesus Christ flat out as the Savior of the world. I reject him as God incarnate. I reject his teaching of the cross of salvation, his bodily resurrection, his virgin birth, everything connected with him except the fact that he was a reformer and a moral teacher. I reject all of that. Uh, I'm your brother Mason. and I'm going to be saved. No. No. And therein lies the rub. You're not dealing with a system of Ooh, salvation. I, I've got to back this you're up You're not going to be saved I'll because back, you're a Mason. You're going to be this, saved by grace. Let's, let's back this up. You're speaking as a Christian. Of course I'm speaking I'm trying as a to ask now for the Masonic view worldwide. The Zoroastrian like, believes... Right, let me the, say to the, you what They the all believe they're going to be worldwide. saved by their own yes, no. brotherhood. No, they don't. They believe... That, that how your choice of how you are going to be saved is up to you. I am a Christian. Yeah. But there is nothing in Masonry to keep you from becoming a Mason if you belong to another faith, if you choose not to believe that. Okay, let me, let me, let me just turn the coin on that. Uh, I had the privilege of speaking in Salt Lake City uh, uh, just a couple weeks back. And when I was there, I checked and I found out that... Uh, Instead of the Bible being on the altar in the Masonic Lodge, we had uh, the Book of Mormon. When I was in Indonesia, instead of the Bible being the book that they swore by, it was the Quran. And when I was up in uh, India, it was the Bhagavad Gita. And uh, in other parts of the United States, it's the Bible. Who told you that the Book of Mormon was on the altar in Salt Lake City? I asked. I wanted to know. I asked. I, I, don't, I, I don't know of a case where, where that would be. Let me uh, quote from Pike. All right. The uh, Bible is an indispensable part of the furniture of a Christian lodge. I've heard that in almost all the books. Next line. Only because it is the sacred book of the Christian religion. The Hebrew Pentateuch in a Hebrew lodge. The Quran in a Mohammedan one. Belong on the altar. And one of these, in the square and the compass, properly understood are the great lights by which a mason must walk and work. Now why? The obligation of the candidate is always to be taken on the sacred book or books of his religion that he may deem it more solemn and binding. And therefore, it was that you were asked of what religion you were. We have no other concern with your religious creed. I, to, to ask a Mohammedan to swear on a Christian Bible would, would, would be ludicrous. It would be sacrilegious. So then the Bible is not the authoritative book of the Masonic Lodge. That's what Walter was saying. Letter, That's what I'm saying. I said, in the United States, the Holy Bible is, is the rule and guide of our faith. Yes. But then I there must that. be something behind the Holy Bible because it's not universal. It's just for this square geographical area here, and over there there's another authoritative book. That was, what, that was where I think Walter it's, was going. It's, well, it's, it's, not, it's not whether or not it's authoritative that, that is what's meaningful here. That's what, that's what he said. What you're ask, asking a candidate to do is obligate himself according to the to highest principles that he knows according to his religion bill, there's no point in having him obligated according to to dr martin's religion or according to my religion okay bill how do you like that in terms of truth in terms of truth truth is truth we're that not way? talking about theology we are talking about a system of morality that is illustrated by the use of the square by the compasses by the level and by the plumb yeah i, I guess that's uh walter you want to pick that up here we've got about three minutes left here I want to I want to pick up the idea that and a very important idea it is too that um, if there's a Muslim or a Buddhist lodge in the United States the Bible is not the center of that 
Uh, that's conceivable. Uh, well, you wouldn't have a Bible, and uh, you just said a minute ago you wouldn't have a Bible and a Muslim. Oh, yes, yeah, there would be all of those. I, in, in, there would still be a, a Christian Bible. In a Muslim in virtually law, any in a Muslim law, in the United law. States. And, sure. a, and the Buddhist scriptures, and the Hindu Upanishads, and the Vedas, they would it's, be there too? If, if it was so desired. But, it's not, but the Bible is required, absolutely. Yes. So, I, I, can I quote you from Ritual? Yeah, go ahead. Every well-governed lodge is furnished with a holy Bible. A square encompasses. The Holy Bible is dedicated to God, it being his inestimable gift to man as the rule and guide of his faith. Great. Now, if that's true, and if this is true, the Holy Bible points out the path which leads to happiness and is dedicated to God because it is the inestimable gift of God to man. All right? Mm -hmm. If that's true, what are you as a Christian doing in the light of the Holy Scriptures which says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me having fellowship with people who deny Jesus Christ as Savior. I am not having fellowship with them. Sure you are. You're in up to the 32nd degree of Masons right now. I don't now. know a single Mason who is not a Christian. Well, I could induce you to plenty of them. Okay. Plenty of them. <laughs> no problem at all. I don't know a single Mason who's not a Christian. <laughs> yeah. I can induce you to Masons who uh, are I, devout Jews who want nothing what? whatever to do with Christianity. Well, I don't know any Jewish Masons. I, I don't... Uh, you know any uh, black ones? And I've never sat... Uh, I know I know members of uh, Prince Hall. I just... Are they members of your lodge? No. Do the Masons allow black people in their lodges? Yes. In, in their lodge? No, as now members? As, yes. In a white lodge? Yes. That's strange Listen, because no, I got I a document Hold it, here no, that's quite uh, interesting. I've sat in lodge, I, or excuse me, I, I know people that have sat in lodge with members of African lodges. Oh, the right. Prince Hall lodges of the United States, it is true, mm -hmm. are, are, have been declared clandestine. That has been a third. Clandestine, they're clandestine. racist. No. Come on. No, stop playing games Dr. with Martin, me. That is absolutely untrue. Well, may I quote? It has been at their choice. And may I, may they I chose quote? not to. Their, their choice. They weren't welcomed. I already checked That's wrong. it out. Listen. That's wrong. You ready? Freemasonry, the Shrine, the Order of Eastern Star, the Knights Temple, the Demolay, the International Order of Rainbow Girls, and numerous others have thus far made no official attempts to admit non-whites to their fraternal membership rosters. Whether these groups will admit non-whites in the future remains to be seen. This is Fraternal Organizations, Alvin Schmidt, the foremost authority in the United States on the Encyclopedia of American Institutions. Masonry denies the basic principle of the Bible, which is that you shall not have discrimination. In Jesus Christ, there is neither barbarian, sickly, enslaved, nor free. They are all one body in Christ, and you're in a racist organization. Not true. Absolutely not true. All right, let's take a break. We'll come back for more of this. Stick with us. Mm -hmm. You said something at the beginning of the program I think is tremendously interesting. You said, Masonry is not a religion. It is not. We quoted Coyle to you, and you said Coyle was a good source. May I quote Coyle again? Masonic Encyclopedia. The gentleman who edited Harold Van Buren Voorhees, 33rd degree Mason, he considered to be an outstanding interpreter of Freemasonry in America today. Under the topic religion, 12 pages were there, 15,000 words on the subject. Quote, Coyle defends Mackey, who call Freemasonry religion, quote, there is nothing to prevent one holding two or three religions which are not inconsistent. Coyle displays a curious ignorance of the relationship between the Old and the New Testament and goes on specifically point by point to establish the concept that Masonry is a religion. He argues 15,000 words worth that it's a religion. Right. But that's his opinion. That is not Masonic doctrine. But he's an authority, a world authority. There are a lot of authorities. But you are you nowhere with every, near no, him, right? Do you agree with everybody that's written about Christianity? You certainly don't. No, but People I, write things in the but, name of Christianity every day that are not, that are not consistent with, with what you might read in the Bible. That's perfectly true, but the problem that we're facing here is that you represent a fraternal organization which every time you are pinned down to give an answer to, you immediately walk away from it and say, well, that's their opinion. Yet, the basics of Masonry are opposed to the basics of Christianity. Masonry says that it's possible to enter heaven by following the teachings of Buddha, Mohammed, Zoroaster, or Confucius. They say that. It's in their books they say that. It does not say that. Okay, let's hold on to that. We'll check it out <laughs> next week, and we'll get the books out and take a look at it, okay? So yeah. please join us.
Tonight we have a very interesting program for you. We are talking with a person who is a Christian to another Christian, and one of the Christians is a 32nd degree Mason in the lodge out in Boise, Idaho. And Bill Mankin is that person. Bill, we're glad that you're here tonight. Sitting next to him is Dr. Walter Martin of the Christian Research Institute, also the distinguished professor of comparative religions at the Simon Greenleaf School of Law. Gentlemen, we're glad that you're here. And uh, the way we got into this program is Bill wrote us a letter concerning uh, some of the things that Dr. Martin had said. Uh, point of fact that, Walter, you called uh, the Masonic Lodge a cult. And uh, what I'd like to start with this week is a quote off of a book that uh, it seems like the majority of those of you that are in the Masonic Lodge will recognize. And it's this. It says, Masonry, around whose altars the Christian, the Hebrew, the Muslim, the Brahmin, the followers of Confucius and Zoroaster can assemble as brethren and unite in prayer to the one God who is above all the Balaam, must needs leave it to its initiates to look for the foundation of his faith and hope to the written scriptures of his own religion. Now, there are at least uh, five books that I've got on the desk back here, Bill, that have this quote in there. And isn't this the reason why you don't want anybody to have uh, a strict dogma because you want to have it open for everybody to bring their own relief, uh, belief and relief, bring their own belief into the lodge and uh, the prayers are basically in a general way to the one all powerful architect, the supreme architect of the universe. Isn't that the gist of it? Well, in, in a sense that's true. There are two things that you do not mention in Lodge at all, ever. One is politics, the other is religion. They are, they are items which would bring disharmony into the Lodge, and the Lodge is based on peace and harmony. Uh, lodges are closed, peace and harmony prevailing. There is, uh, the whole concept of brotherhood is geared toward non-controversial matters. Do you have an altar in the Lodge? We have, uh, we have a, a, an item in the lodge which is described as an altar. There are no sacrifices on it. <laughs> Why did you call it an altar? Why don't you just call it a desk? Because it's not a desk. It, uh, it has the Bible on it. Walter? Quote, some attempt to avoid the issues by saying that Freemasonry is not a religion, but is religious. Freemasonry is not a religion, but is most emphatically religion's handmade, they say. This has been challenged as meaningless which it seems to be. Coyle goes on to assert... This is in the Encyclopedia of Freemasonry that right. just came out. Just came out. Goes on to assert that it is a religion. Does Freemasonry have meetings characterized by the practice of rites and ceremonies in and by which its creed, tenets, and dogmas are illustrated by myths, symbol, and allegories? Yes, so does religion. The Masonic Encyclopedia now centers attention on the lodge as a church. That brings us to the real crux of the matter. The difference between a lodge and a church is one of degree and not of kind. The fact that Freemasonry is a mild religion does not mean that it is no religion. Freemasonry has a religious service to commit the body of a deceased brother to the dust from whence it came. And Freemasonry utilizes consecration through corn, wine, and oil, just as in the finest cathedral or church. All of the indications of all of the material uh, is that you have everything connected with religion arose by any other name will smell as sweet. Uh, I guess now we're getting Call it what you want, but that's what it is. If it looks like a duck, it walks like a duck. And it quacks like a duck, it's a duck. Like a duck. <laughs> uh, I, here again, we come back, we still come back to the thing there, that the symbols are related to the character of man to man. They are not related to God. The, uh, we have no symbols that are religious in the sense of symbols in a church. All right, let me, the, I, I've the, got your own no, encyclopedia. Give me, give me a break, John. Let me finish. Okay, well, I thought... <laughs> I want to uh, hear this. All right. Uh, I'm lost. You, uh... Well, here, I was going to quote your own authority uh, historian who asks questions. He says, a very unusual course is to affirm that true masonry is neither a religion nor consisting of religious aspects. This is in uh, a new encyclopedia of Freemasonry by Arthur Edward Waite. And uh, then he asks the questions that I want to ask you. Here's a Mason asking the questions. In such case, why does it insist on that root of contention, faith in a great architect of the universe? First question. Why does it require an intellectual ad adherence to the notion of resurrection to a future life? 
however resurrection is to be understood. Why are its rights in all degrees and under all systems in reality neither more nor less than pageants of prayer and aspirations? We're going to get down to the third level here. Can the third degree of the craft, apart from religion, teach a man how to die as it claims to? What does the lesson of the mystical lecture in the Holy Royal Arch, by its own claims, impress on its members concerning the Royal Arch degree? I'm not a Royal Arch Mason. Well, the answer uh, is, he says, that it inspires its members with the most exalted ideas of deity. And he says, what is this but religion? Here's your own historian. It's, uh, well, that's, uh, he is not an official historian of Masonry. Here is a man that, that, that characterizes Masonry as a religion. What there, I find that, is that... But it also says that you bring whatever religion you want into the lodge room. So, th so that it's not. That by the very fact you're saying that, you're not okay, characterizing let's turn, Masonry let's turn as a religion. Let's turn the coin over then, Bill. Let's turn the coin over. I've quoted to you five encyclopedias, the Masonic Bible, and you say all of these that I've quoted, which we have gotten from the Grand Lodges around the country, they said that they hold to these beliefs. Now let's put it the other way. Is there any book that you could point us to that says that Jesus Christ alone is God or that uh, the Masonic Lodge uh, strictly does not deal uh, in talking about the future life like they do in the third, uh, third arch degree there? Uh, as is said. Do you have any books that recant of all that? There, there is nothing in Masonic ritual today that would identify Christ as Lord. But, it, but, uh, but you have prayers, you have an altar, you have a uh, funeral service at the end uh, for those that are Masons, you have uh, all of these people advocating the fact that it is religious. Where that do we is, go? That is their opinion. There are just as many people that advocate that it is not a religion. But they're not writing the books, are they? Well, Alphonse, Alphonse Serza says that it's not a religion. Uh, Alphonse Serza, I know he does, uh, but you can't really quote Alphonse Serza because he's not authoritative. Why isn't he authoritative? Well, because I don't think he is. After all, if you don't think so. <laughs> well, I don't think there's a, Okay, but it's the same thing. It's, what, what we're talking about is opinion. And, and opinion is opinion. It's, it's just that. Alphonse uh, If a Serza. man chooses to characterize masonry as religion, a religion, that's his business. Okay, uh, if it's certainly was, not it, mine. Can I, guess, I uh, bring a point up? Certainly. Uh, Alphonse Serza's book, Let There Be Light, A Study of Anti-Masonry, highly recommended. Have you have it right there. <laughs> Isn't that right? You have it, too. You count him authoritative. Yeah. Uh, you, <laughs> you got that from the Masonic Service Association of the United States, which mails out literature in the name of the Masons all over the country. And here's a letter from its executive secretary explaining that this is the best and most authoritative statement against those who criticize masonry in existence. So I thought I better get the best that there was, and I got Serza. And I read what Serza had to say, and he's a distinguished writer and author and so forth and so on, despite the fact that the same organization recommends Mackey, Waite, Pike. Pike, Coyle, as world authorities on masonry, and Serza is not in their class. I'm going to give you, I'm going to say one of the things that you love to say, and I've, I've seen you say on many, many occasions. You quote out of context. You take a, a, a paragraph. Your girl, Sharon Mather, at the Christian Research Institute, mm -hmm. sent me 10 paragraphs, 12 paragraphs, on why Masonry was not Christian. Not from me. Uh, no. I didn't the, quote the out of context. The paragraphs came but, out of... But I didn't do it. Well, Sharon did. But I didn't. Okay. I'm not Sharon. <laughs> uh, and said, told me why Masonry was not Christian and why I shouldn't be a Mason and a Christian at the same time. Yeah. Morals and dogma, a lot of it didn't even have to do with the three degrees. Morals and dogma is a thousand pages long. The books you just had there are, are hundreds of, and, and in many cases more than a thousand pages, and you give me a paragraph. And say, uh, this is it. And those... you've done the same thing to people that'll pick things Would out of the Would you say Bible. that what I quoted to you is out of context? It's out of context with the whole, with the whole chapter, with the whole thing that everybody said. Oh, boy, I'd love to read. Uh, I recommend those We don't have time to go through the no, whole thing. No, but we do, we do have think. time to go into the three degrees in a couple of minutes. But, Certainly. you know, you said something before that was interesting. When I made a statement last week about Hindus and Buddhists and everybody uh, and um, sort of fatherhood of God, brotherhood of man, neighborhood of lodge, um, we were talking about it. Um, I thought it would be interesting to uh, get some of the sources on masonry and quote what they had to say. The Holy Bible is the great light of masonry. You believe that? I believe that. So far, no responsible Masonic authority has held that a Freemason must believe the Bible or any part of it. Because it's not a religion. But 
what good does it do to talk about the Holy Bible as the great light of masonry if you're not required to turn on a switch? <laughs> you're walking around in darkness saying it's a great light. When we come you back, you don't use it. When we come back, I would like to read you the charge from the first degree. Can I uh, allow that? Can I give you the third degree? <laughs> <laughs> Joke. The, uh, <laughs> the all-seeing eye pervades the innermost recesses of the human heart and will reward us according to our merits. Ritual. There is an immortal spark in man. Ritual. There was never a false god, nor was there ever really a false religion, unless you call a child a false man. Masonic monitor. I, for one, can never understand how anyone who takes an exclusive view of Christ as the only revelation of God's truth can become a Freemason without suffering from spiritual schizophrenia. Be assured, read that before. Be assured that God is equally present with the pious Hindu in the temple, the Jew in the synagogue, the Mohammedan in the mosque, and the Christian in the church. Mackey's Encyclopedia of Freemasonry. Now, Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Neither is there salvation in any other. There is no other name given under heaven among men whereby you must be saved. It is one of the basic tenets of masonry, whether you want to own up to it or not, that whatever a brother's religion may be is irrelevant. He's still a brother. You defend him, and that inevitably he has as much a chance for eternal salvation as anybody else. That's not strictly true. In the Christian lodge it might not be, but it is well, everywhere else. It is. No, what we hold that a man's belief are sacred to himself. I can't tell a man as Supposing a member of, of a lodge. Supposing they're false. I, well, then I, then I, would, I, uh, I would speak to him, I would witness to him as a Christian outside the lodge. I'm not going to make him a Christian inside the lodge. So that you would say that when you have those prayers to the one supreme God and he doesn't agree with your Christian God, why are you praying? We are praying to the same God, the one God, are we? the all-creating God, the same God that is on the dollar bill, and God we trust. Right. And the, the Hindus, too, and the, the Buddhists, and, and the same all all Islam, they're all well, doing that? You're nitpicking, and that's not really what No, no, really no, that's very, fa that's very factual. That's the minute. That's the crux of the whole yep. thing. The God of the Bible is not the God of the Hindus. The God of the Bible is not the God of the Buddhists. The God of the Bible is not Allah. The God of the Bible is the Lord, eternal God, who became man in Jesus Christ. You cannot call him by all these different names and say you're talking about the one God. That's we, biblical nonsense. We, we are not doing that. When I just say said a that prayer, a minute no, ago. Said, when I say a prayer in lodge, I say a prayer to my God. The, the, what, but they're praying the same was, God. No, when I acted as chaplain, I, I said my own prayer. I didn't even use the prayer. In a Buddhist in lodge. There was no point in doing it. In a Buddhist that. lodge in a Zoroastrian lodge, in a Muslim lodge, are they praying to the same God you're praying to? They are praying to their God. To the same God you're praying to? Well, no, I, I, I can't say that. Then they're lost, right? Yes, but they're still Masons. But they're lost. <laughs> but so they're you, still Masons. So all your yeah, Masonic you, you, brothers, I, I want to get this out, all your Masonic brothers who reject Jesus Christ's gospel and follow these things, even in the full light of Masonry, are lost. <laughs> According to my beliefs of, as a Christian, yes. Thank you. Okay, we'll take a break. And but we'll that's come their choice. We'll, All right. We'll, I believe that. I believe you're right. Okay. okay. We're going to take a break. Believe it. We'll take it. And here we're going to take it right now. And we'll come right back. We're back. And uh, we're talking about the relationship of the Masonic Lodge to Orthodox Christianity. And our guests are Bill Mankin from Boise, Idaho, who's a 32nd degree Mason and Dr. Walter Martin of the Christian Research Institute. Gentlemen, uh, I've got a book in my hands uh, right here. It's called Duncan's Ritual of Freemasonry. And uh, I've read this in a few books. Maybe I'm not supposed to, but uh, I've got it, and I'm going to bring it up. It says that um, the Royal Arch Degree, which is the seventh degree in the Masonic Lodge, describes the lost name of God as J.B.O., and the, Mas the Masons here have uh, a whole two pages right here describing what uh, JBO means. Actually, Ja, Bull, and An is the entire word. Walter, I'm sure that you're familiar with this. Uh, would you explain why uh, possibly uh, as a Christian you object to uh, what the Royal Arch or the Seventh Degree 
Uh, Masons have swore never to reveal this, and why is it they're holding this? Yah is the uh, only two word, only vowel and consonant that we know in Hebrew for the name of God in the Old Testament, Yah, J-A, or Y-A, depending upon it, pronunciation. Uh, on is for Osiris, the pagan god of the Egyptians, uh, and uh, Bul is for the uh, concept of Baal, and you have an unholy trinity in which you unite two pagan concepts with the concept of the God of the Bible. And uh, at least this, is, this has been uh, documented and affirmed by uh, scholars who have studied masonry a great deal longer than I have. And I have no reason to dispute well, right here in Duncan's translation. book, it says that uh, this guys, being guys is worthy of our utmost me. veneration. You're both one up on me because I know nothing of that. Uh, that's uh, the Royal Arch is, is a York Rite. I'm not a York Rite Mason. I'm a Scottish Rite Mason. And if that in fact exists in the York Rite, I you know I can't speak to it. We'll give you the references. And you can check it out. It's there because yeah, the, the combination of the pagan names strikes you instantly. Because uh, also in the Old Testament you have a direct ref, uh, revelation from God about how He feels about those other two gods being linked with Him. Let me give you an example. First Kings 16. And Ahab did evil in the sight of the Lord, and it came to pass as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, that he took the wife Jezebel and then went and served one of those gods, Baal, and worshipped him. God says, terrible. Judges 3, 7. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and forgot the Lord their God and served Baal. Therefore the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. The God that you know and that I know says, in no way do that. No way link yourself with that. Well, John, since you raised this issue, I think that uh, there's something additional that should be brought up with it. And that is that uh, in the right at that time they state, quote, we three do meet and agree in peace, love, and unity, the sacred word to keep and never to divulge the same until we three or three such as we do meet and agree. No royal archmason can pronounce the name himself. It has to be three of them together before they can do it, and the three names, two pagan and one uh, Christ, uh, Christian, are pronounced. Why talk about this? I, you know, I can't argue it with you. I, I, I can't, you know, I have nothing on which to base uh, what you're saying. I don't even know what you're saying is true, I, you know, because I'm not a royal archmason. That's part of the York right. That's not part of the Scottish right. Mm-hmm. How about uh, let's move on to something else then here, and that would be... Um, you are on the 19th level. You've gone past the 19th level of masonry, though, haven't you? There are, there are the 4th through the 32nd degrees in Scottish Rite. You've there, been, but Scottish Rite would, would include the 19th, wouldn't it? It would include the 19th You've degree, You've been yes. through that. I, no, I haven't. It was, it was, uh, I, have, uh, uh, I have had some passages read to me. That was not an exemplified degree uh -huh. in our jurisdiction. But it is, but it is a, a bona fide degree. Yes, since it is in your Scottish rite, permit me to read this. The discussion was to be of the first three degrees blue lodge. Well, I would I, run far afield. We I, I wasn't apprised that you were restricted to just three levels. Believe me, I came prepared to discuss everything through the thirty-third. Uh, and uh, well, there these, again, I'm not a thirty-third degree. Yeah, but these these quotes are are to me very important because they're part of masonry, and uh, you are representing masonry. Uh, as uh, a loyal Mason, it says, To any chapter of this degree to which I may belong, and the edicts, laws, and mandates of the grand consistory of sublime princes and commanders of the royal secret, as well as those of the Supreme Council of the 32nd degree. It is then that the thrice puissant announce him with o anoints him with oil on the crown of his head and says, Be thou a priest forever after the order of of Melchizedek. And after receiving the password, Emmanuel, and the sacred word, Alleluia, he is dressed in a robe of white linen and given a cordon, sash of honor worn across the breast of crimson color. Scottish Rite, Masonry Illustrated, The Complete Ritual, Volume 2, E. Cook Publications, 1974. Is it not significant to you, as a Christian, 
that in the seventh chapter of the epistle to the Hebrew, Jesus Christ alone occupies the priesthood of Melchizedek. In fact, the Greek says he holds it inviolate and untransferable. I have to, now, go, back. Uh, me, I have uh, to go back to symbolism. Uh, we have to go back uh, to, let me, to let a me, symbolic but, act and not something that is but designed I to... can't say to you, you're a priest after the order of Melchizedek when that's our Lord's priesthood. Or I don't want you to. But that right says they do it to people that aren't even Christians. You're giving the priesthood of Jesus Christ who intercedes for us in heaven as our Lord to people that don't even acknowledge him as God. That's what I'm saying. That's why Masonry is a cult. It denies the only Lord God, our Lord Jesus Christ. It does Christ. not deny. It does not deny. It doesn't deny him. No, it doesn't. By doesn't saying deny anybody. there's salvation in others. This is, we're running far afield. The, the Hindu, you're, the, the you're Buddhist, choosing, they're all the you're same. Choosing, no, you're choosing, you're choosing to make this into a conversation that you want it to do. And uh, I, I was led to believe that I was going to be able to discuss these things. I asked you, John, I said, may I read the charge of the first degree? Let's talk about it. We Fine talked with about me. It. I, I said, just think we can, ought to look can, at that one. Can we talk about the first th three degrees of masonry? Let's talk about Blue Lodge. Okay. That's why I wrote the letter. It's okay but, with me. But, but the, the same thing is... Possibly you are committed not to talking about those, and it might be my fault for not communicating the fact of that. I, I didn't pick that up. I understood we wanted to talk about those three, but not the fact that we were limited just to those three. And we, we intend to talk about those three, but what Walter is saying, too, is documented, and it is true. And the question that comes back is the fact of you have you've said that you are a 32nd degree. And the fact is you've got to be familiar with that. The, the, the fact is that I'm familiar with the three degrees that I work in, the 15th, the 21st, and the 30th. The rest of it I've had read to me one time. Okay. Uh, that didn't the, register when, it, when they read it to you? The, uh, I, I told you, we don't go through a number. You don't receive all 32 degrees. You don't receive all 32 degrees. A number, you, uh, a number of degrees are exemplified. A number of degrees are what they call communicated. And in that case, you, uh, you merely discuss it. For, you may discuss it for as little as five or ten minutes. You certainly says, don't go through the entire ritual of the degree. The I have no knowledge say, of that degree. The scripture does say no one I know what the scripture says. Christ. I have no problem with that. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's shut it down for this week. And I want to come back and ask you the question next week. Let's turn the coin over one more time. Then, as a Christian, you're saying that it really doesn't make any difference what idea or image you think about in terms of God, just as long as you believe in a God. I would argue that also. Okay, let's wait next week. We'll pick it up right there. Please join us. talking about the relationship of the Masonic Lodge to Orthodox Christianity. Should there be a relationship? And we have two fellow Christians on stage tonight. One, William Mankin from Boise, Idaho, who's a 32nd degree Mason in the Lodge there. And uh, then Dr. Walter Martin, who is the founder of the Christian Research Institute and professor of, of uh, contemporary and comparative religions at Simon Greenleaf School of Law. Uh, guys, we're glad that you're here. And uh, we left on uh, a tough note last week, Bill, and that was the sense that uh, we touched on a, on a degree that uh, you felt that we shouldn't talk about, and uh, we felt well, that, that... First of all, John, I'm going to interrupt for a second. You, you touched on a degree that I knew nothing about, okay. and then secondly, you, you, you touched on a degree, the 19th degree in the Scottish Rite, that I have not received directly. I, so, uh, and okay. and also the... mentioned things that... that even had I received them, I would have been prevented from discussing because of my obligation. Okay. Let's talk about that obligation because you're sitting there holding two hats in a sense. You're a Christian, you're also a Mason. And the fact is that when Walter was talking about if this is true, okay, if this is true on the other side, that the Masonic Lodge is passing out the fact of uh, uh, the right of the Melchizedek priesthood, which Hebrews says that only Jesus Christ has. He is our only Savior and you hold that in your mind as a Christian. Okay, but on the other sense, uh, I have to ask you, at that point, when you come into conflict with your Christian belief, when you would say, you know, my Masonic vows tell me that I should not speak out on that. I should not talk about it. Even if I had an opinion, I shouldn't talk about that. I'm saying, doesn't it sound like our allegiance has, as a, on the Christian side of the fence, from our Christian audience that's looking in tonight, doesn't it sound like you fudged? 
No, because again, I, as I said, a system of allegory or a system of morality veiled in allegory, illustrated by symbols. I, I, nobody is conferring any priesthood. They are symbolically saying, I, giving a lesson, and that's all it is. It's a moral lesson, symbolic. There is no conferral of the priesthood. Well, There's a conferral of a degree. Would you think that it, uh, just by saying those words that it doesn't mean anything? No, I think this is a cop-out. I think it's a cop-out for a Christian to belong to the Masons because first and foremost, our allegiance is to the Lord Jesus Christ. King of kings, Lord of lords, he transcends Masonry by infinity. And therefore, to even for a moment consider Masonry to even be uh, comparable in anything to the revelation God gave in Christ uh, and uh, to even countenance some of these things uh, is to me reprehensible. But I really feel that Bill is sincere and I think that he should discuss those three rights uh, that he's an expert in and that we should respond to that because after all that's what he came to do. Okay, let's pick one, Walter, and uh, let's go I, through maybe all three of them. I asked you earlier if I could uh, uh, give, the, uh, give the charge to the first degree. Okay. Because it's, uh, I, I think it's beautiful. It take, it'll just take me a couple of minutes to read it. This happens to every first degree Mason. This is published, and this is part of, of the things that, that everybody should know about Masonry. My brother, having passed through the ceremonies of your initiation, allow me to congratulate you on your admission into our ancient and honorable fraternity. Ancient has existed from time immemorial and honorable as tending to make all men so who are strictly obedient to its precepts. It is, it is an institution having for its foundation the practice of social and moral virtues and to so high an eminence has its credit has been advanced that in every age and country men preeminent for their moral and intellectual attainments have encouraged and promoted its interests nor has it been thought derogatory to their dignity that monarchs have, for a season, exchanged the scepter for the trowel to patronize our mysteries and join in our assemblies. As a Mason, you are re to regard the volume of the sacred law as the great light in your profession, to consider it as an unerring standard of truth and justice, and to re regulate your actions by its divine precepts it contains. In it you will learn the important duties which you owe to God, your neighbor, and yourself, to God by never mentioning his name except with that awe and reverence which is due from the creature to, to his creator, by imploring his aid in all lawful undertakings and by looking up to him in every emergency for comfort and support, to your neighbor by acting with him upon the square, by re rendering him every kind office which justice or mercy may require, by relieving his distresses and soothing his afflictions, and by doing to him as in similar cases you would that he should do unto you and to yourself by such prudent and well-regulated discipline as may best conduce to the preservation of your corporeal and mental faculties in their fullest energy, thereby enabling you to exert the talents wherewith God has blessed you, as well to his glory as to the welfare of your fellow citizens. As a citizen, you are enjoined to be exemplary in the discharge of your civil duties by never proposing or countenancing an any act which may have a tendency to subvert the peace and good order of society by paying due obedience to the laws under whose protection you live and by never losing sight of the allegiance due to your country. As an individual, you are charged to practice the domestic and public virtues. Let temperance chasten, fortitude support, and prudence direct you, and let justice be the guide of all your actions. Be especially careful to maintain in their fullest splendor those truly Masonic tenets, brotherly love, relief, and truth. Finally, be faithful to the trust committed to your care and manifest your fidelity to the principles by a strict observance of the constitutions of Freemasonry, by adhering to the ancient landmarks of the fraternity, and by refusing to recommend anyone to a participation in our privileges unless you have a strong belief that by similar fidelity he will ultimately reflect honor on our ancient institution. Now, what's wrong with that? If I That's was, a noble purpose. I would say that as a Christian, I wouldn't join knowing that two states over when they refer to the fact of in everything that you do, consult the deity in all things that you do, that they're talking about a different deity than you are. Not and that what, maybe in another country. Right. Maybe. Two states over, right in Utah. I, uh, well, I don't know who told you that the Book of Mormon is on the, on the, on the altar in, in Utah. But well, I'm I, very I concerned. Absolutely. I, I don't know about that. There is an antagonism in, in, in Utah. 
from, from Masons and Mormonism because, in the, as, as you probably know, there are some parallels in Temple Mormonism and the Masonic ritual. There is a great deal of antagonism in Utah regarding that. And I know for a fact there have been cases where... Uh, I'm just saying that they say to, if, if, if that's the same thing that's presented all over the world, is that the same thing or do you change it state by state? That's, that's the Idaho monitor. That's the only thing I can speak to. But I have a hunch that, the, that if you will look in the Tennessee monitor, you will find something not much different from Okay, that. so I would assume that I'd find that in India. I'd find it in Indonesia. I'd find it uh, in Africa. I would find it... Uh, With the inherent uh, translation and that's what I'm saying. How is it that you as a Christian can say, I will go with that if they are say, saying that you should support and uphold and believe in that holy book, which you as a Christian, coming in looking at that, realize that if you went to any of those lodges in those countries or went into Utah, that you would have to say, no, I don't want you to follow the allegiance of that holy book and uh, pray to that uh, God. No, that's, you're talking, John, about an individual thing. This is an individual thing. That I don't the, change my beliefs by going into another lodge. I don't change my beliefs. I don't deny God. Neither does any other Christian. So you don't see any problem with being part of a worldwide fellowship that can change their belief in whatever lodge that they're in. You can just you can simply join up because you, you and your part of the You don't change your beliefs. You don't change your beliefs. John, I think that we ought to get to the bottom line in this entire thing. Uh, he read the charge of the first degree. Uh, I think we also ought to approach this, as we're both Christians, from the perspective of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the scripture says that we have an obligation first to Christ. Uh, he's our Lord, and that obligation commands us to go to the scripture, and Christ is our final authority. We cannot afford to have any view that is contrary to the view of, script, of Christ as recorded in scripture on any subject. Whatever he says is the final word for us, at least if we're honestly Christians. Now, in your three levels that you're talking about before, um, you also, in your blue lodges, have to swear specific oaths. Your books, which have been published, give those oaths. In the first degree, you Receive on the point of a sharp instrument pressing your naked left breast, which is to teach you, as this is an instrument of torture to your flesh, so should the recollection of it ever be to your mind and conscience, should you attempt to reveal the secrets of masonry unlawfully. <coughs> Each novice enters alone after passing the test of fear, a knife point symbolically at his breast, and is bound hand and foot. Uh, um, that's not... There again, that's not part of our ritual. It's the apprentice mason's yeah, ritual. Well, that's, that's some, somebody's apprentice mason ritual. Well, the problem is with most Masonic ritual as it has been printed, yeah. it has been pr printed by malcontents. And what you have is something that is essentially true. Uh -huh. that, but, and and, and uh, granted, that there is a portion of that that is essentially true. But the purposes behind it, I, I, well, let's again, put it you're taking it out of context. Well, I'm, not, I'm in context now, okay? Binding myself under no less penalty than that We're of having my throat the obligation. Cut. I told you that I didn't want to do that, and I would not do that. Okay. I will not what, discuss what can we the discuss obligation. Then, I will discuss an obligation with you in general. Well, well, let, let me let me let me be specific in this one. Why thing, read okay? that? There is no point. Well, I'm just. This is the point. See, the point is, you said what's wrong with what I just read to you. That's what the That's question right. you asked. Okay? I didn't just read. I'm that about thing. to tell you what's I didn't just wrong. Read okay, what, I'm about to did. tell you. So let me tell you. You don't have to even comment. Okay, I just want to show you what's wrong. Okay, from a Christian perspective, binding myself on a no less penalty than that of having my throat cut from ear to ear, my tongue torn out by its roots and buried in the rough sands of the sea at low water mark, where the tide ebbs and flows twice in 24 hours. Should I ever knowingly or willingly violate this my solemn oath and obligation as an entered apprentice mason? So help me God and keep me steadfast in the due performance of the same. Jesus Christ had something most interesting to say in this area. And since he is the I sovereign... I have read Matthew. <laughs> since he is the sovereign... Well, I wasn't going to read that. Uh, that was coming second. Okay. Uh, I was going to read the epistle to James to show that it was still in force in the New Testament. And who was, what Jesus who was said. James speaking to? Uh, if I can finish, okay. All right. In James chapter 5, 
we find these words. Above all, my brothers, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. Let your yes be yes and your no, no, or you will be judged. Now, in the degrees of masonry, the first three that you are expert in, you are swearing oaths in diametric opposition to Holy Scripture. The Lord Jesus in Matthew chapter 5 was very clear. Swear no oath at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, earth for its footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it's the city of the great king. Do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. Simply say, Bill, yes, yes, or no, no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Now, that's yeah. Christ on swearing oaths. That and you are in there, in that temple, swearing to God to pull out your tongue, bury you in the sand. Enough. Give me a chance. I mean, right. no, I, I, this, this is symbolic. your own oath. The obligations are symbolic. The obligations have always been But you're been swearing. Symbolic. No. When Christ was speaking yeah. to the Hebrews... Yeah. As, he, uh, as James quotes uh -huh. and as Matthew quotes, yeah. he was saying because he was correcting perversions that existed at the time. At the time, a Jew didn't have to tell the truth unless he was placed under oath. He, and further, if that oath was not in proper context, he still didn't have to troth, tell the truth. Let me finish. Uh, he still didn't have to tell the truth unless he, uh, uh, even though he was under oath. Okay, let's hold on to it, and you can come back to it. We've got to take a break here, and we'll come back, and we'll pick up the rest of this, because uh, I need to break away. Stick with us. All right, we're back. We're talking about the relationship of the Masonic Lodge to Orthodox Christianity. Should there be a relationship? And we're talking about one of the commandments of Jesus Christ, which he gave in Matthew, which he said, Swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it's his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And uh, yet at the same time, we come uh, to Christians going into the lodge. They, it seems, are demanded upon that they must swear. What about that, Bill? Going back to what we said before the break, at the time, Christ was correcting various perversions that were used. And in essence, what he was saying was, and I quote uh, from the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia and also from Alphonse Serza, that oaths are permissible to Christians is sown by the example of our Lord uh, in Matthew when Caiaphas uh, said, I adjure thee by the living God. Tell me if you are the Son of God. Christ didn't swear. He, the high priest did. He was did. placed under oath. The high priest said, I command uh, you in the name of right. the living God. Okay. But Jesus didn't swear anything. He answered. Peter took an oath in 73, denying that he even knew Christ. He denied Christ with an oath. But it was accompanied with a curse. No, no, it's uh, and well, he also not in my Bible. <laughs> okay. But you, Bill, didn't he repent reading. of that? That's a Masonic no, it, Bible. No, in, se in 73, after a while... <laughs> After a while came unto him, they that stood by and said to Peter, Surely thou art also one of them, for they... No, oh, excuse me. Um, uh, in 72. And again, he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. The third time he the began to curse swear. and swear. Yeah, well, but well, let me ask this question, though. Is the Bible pointing that out as right behavior? Well, it's uh, that the judicial oath is he, he, permissible. There's, there's we go no back. Well, right, no, I, I think that he swore, no doubt about that. But the thing is, isn't that what he asked the Lord to forgive him about? In Second Corinthians. Now, look, let's get through this let's, one quick, okay? Quite, no, the there answer, is swearing. Swearing yeah, existed. Uh, the, exists. answer, the answer is this, okay? It's very simple. If Paul swore an oath, if John swore an oath, if Peter swore an oath, it doesn't change the fact that Jesus said, don't do it. Disobedience is disobedience, no matter who does it. The interpretation. That's simple as that. Just, no, it depends on the interpretation. This is, not inter this is not interpretation. This is a simple phrase. Do not swear at all. Now, you tell me what that means. 
it was uh, interpret was, it for me do uh, not don't I, read I that did. don't read that just he tell was me interpreting it to mean no, no, that because no, of the no, problems no, that existed no, at the no, time no, no. that he is was what, not saying never that swear. is what that is what a commentator said i want you to tell me sitting I'm here i'm giving you my opinion no no you give me a commentator i read it before you did i'm telling you what it says okay i want you to tell me what you no, think I didn't this read means. the part from the davis and the, the, from davis not Davis. I have but for me ISBE. I have it. Okay. It says, "Do not swear at all." Now, what does that mean to you? In context of what we are what dealing with at that time, you have to deal with. Supposing it. I just say to you, "Don't walk out that door at all." <coughs> what does that mean to you? The context is this room. There's the door. You're sitting here. I said, don't walk out the door. What does that mean to you? It means, very simply, don't get up and walk out the door. Now, I don't care what the context is, you don't do it. Jesus said, don't swear at all. Then to be explicit, he said, don't swear by the throne of God. Don't swear by the temple in Jerusalem. Don't swear by the earth itself. Don't even swear by the hairs of your head. Let your yes be yes and your no be no because everything else comes from satan my pub also says from evil it doesn't say from the evil one it's in the it greek just, evil one okay uh, well i'm sure it is and I yeah, it's read there the, the devil is the author of, of oaths god says he doesn't want them forbids them you go into a courtroom even our government recognizes this you do not have to say i swear by Almighty God. When you go in for conscription in the service oh, of the United States, incidentally, you can say, I affirm. There are two jurisdictions yeah. that permit you to make an, an affirmation. Sure. One of them is not Tennessee. One of them is not Idaho. Yeah. Uh, Federal law exempts you from ever swearing the name of God, if you want. And they can't, it's First Amendment of the Constitution exercises the rights of freedom of religion. And, and yet, uh, the, the judicial oath, I, I, I feel the judicial oath is recognized as lawful. And I feel it, when, when, uh, Paul said, he says, as God is, I'm paraphrasing, as God is my witness. He said, I'm speaking the truth. Well, James told you too. James says, don't swear at all. He was speaking to the 12 tribes. He was dealing specifically would you with be willing, this Would you be willing to say that the epistle problem? of James was just addressed to the 12 tribes? Or That's to the what church. it said. Well, or of course, no, obviously. But, but, if but it's it, obvious, was, it was specifically dealing with that problem. But if it's obvious... That it's the 12, James also the, said, "Faith without works is dead." He's right. <laughs> he's right. <laughs> so faith without works is dead. He's right. I agree okay. with you. But he's also right when he says, "Don't swear at all; you'll be judged for it." And you're swearing, and I want you to be judged. So biblically, is that a not direct unsound ground? Is, see what the the rub then, Bill, is: Are you disobeying a direct command? Of Jesus Christ. I don't see it as, as disobeying uh, a direct command of Jesus Christ. How would I, Jesus I have, what would Jesus have to have said for you to have thought that he was saying, don't swear at all? I, I, it would not, you would have to take it in the context of but saying. What would he have to say, though? How, what, what would convince you that you were not to swear any oaths at all? What would he have to tell you? I don't know. I do. I know. Swear no <laughs> oaths at all. <laughs> Very simple. <laughs> Uh, as I said, was, there's just been, uh, we have discussed it on that basis. It's, it's, there, are, there were conditions existed then that do not exist now. And in ordinary speech, in, in, in trifling and profane matters, don't swear at all. But the judicial oath is lawful. In other words, there, Jesus said, do not swear by anything at all, by heaven, by earth, by the hairs of your head. Caiaphas said to Jesus, Jesus, I adjure thee by the living God. Tell me if you're the son of God. And Jesus said, you bet your but, sweet but, bippy but, I'm the uh, son of God. Yeah, but... <laughs> it's a great theological term. <laughs> uh, I'm not a theologian. Uh, yes, uh, we got one us, minute left, Walter. One let's, minute. Let's, just, let's just keep in mind that this is not biblical theology and um, is very contradictory to it. But you know, in, in the conclusion, as long as we're concluding this thing, one thing did impress me. Masonry is not a religion, but at the consecration of monuments and funerals, you sing this hymn, the Master Mason's Hymn, a verse of which I read. The future sons of grief shall sigh while standing round in mystic tie and raise their hands, alas, to heaven in anguish that no hope 
is given, to which I respond, and to masonry, <laughs> if in this life only we have hope in Christ, of all men we are most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. And thank God he's alive because masonry is dead. All right, we're going to close on that. We're going to come back with questions from the audience next week, so please join us. that you join us tonight. We're talking about the relationship of the Masonic Lodge to Christian faith. Are they compatible or incompatible? And my guests are actually two Christians. Mr. William Mankin, who is from Boise, Idaho. He's a 32nd degree Mason, also a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Bill, we're glad that you're here. And then, of course, Dr. Walter Martin from the Christian Research Institute, the distinguished professor of comparative religions at Simon Greenleaf School of Law. Dr. Martin, we're glad that you're here. Guys, I want to come this week to you and start going back on this thing. Over and over again, you hear the Masonic Lodge is not religious. Although, I have five uh, authoritative books, including three encyclopedias on Freemasonry that are relatively new, that are all saying, we have to quit saying that. It's a religion. No way to get around it. Bill, let me come to you. Doesn't it seem from looking in, anybody on the outside looking in, you have an altar in the midst of the lodge. You have a Bible on the altar. You have the first thing that a person has to agree to to become a part of the lodge is they have to believe in the belief of a supreme being. Okay? You say prayers during your lodge meetings. You have, in the oath that you read to us uh, a ways back, you said that uh, you are to consult the deity of the sacred book on a continual basis in everything that you do. If that's not religious, how could it be? It's not religious in the context of a religion. We are religious in the fact that we are devoted to God, but the principles of masonry are, and, and one thing that I haven't really been able to mention tonight, is the, the principles of, of governing your life by the working tools of a mason, the historical working tools of a mason, the masonry that has existed since 20 centuries before Christ. Uh, uh, Confucius said, or a pupil of, of uh, Confucius, Mencius, said, ah, boy, I have to look it up. Okay, while he's looking it up, yes. Dr. Martin, let me come back to you on this thing. Do you think that a person can swear his allegiance to a supreme being, the architect, the grand architect of the universe, can say prayers to that grand architect, can govern his life in relationship to a holy book that can differ here in the United States compared to India or Africa. Does that bother you as a Christian? Is that religion? It would bother me as a professor of comparative religion. I'd flunk any student who took my course who told me it wasn't a religion. Uh, it has every hallmark of religion, every standard of religion. Uh, you can call it whatever you want to call it. Uh, but religion it certainly is. I think we should invoke the law of contradiction also here, uh, and that is either all the religions of the world are wrong or one of them is right. And uh, if we're going to talk about the God that Masonry is talking about, and uh, Bill just used the phrase we a minute ago, well, he really can't say that, we. He can speak for himself. That's true. And he cannot speak for masonry in terms of other masons because there are hindu masons there are buddhist masons there are zoroastrian masons there are masons of jewish persuasion uh, who reject uh, the biblical revelation of jesus christ and christianity who reject the cross uh, who reject uh, the revelation which he and i both believe let me ask you the question here that i asked bill just a moment ago and then i'll have his response masonry says Point blank, that it does not matter what idea or images you conjure up of God, just as so you believe in a God. Isn't that contrary to Christian thinking, that there is definite content to God? That was, this is my whole point before when I talked about contradiction. Uh, it's senseless to talk about believing in the great architect uh, of the universe and uh, the principle of nature and the great creator and everything else and thinking for one moment that the... Uh, Mohammedan and the Buddhist and the Zoroastrian and the Sikh 
uh, and the Christian and the Jew are all talking about the same God because they're not. Actually, that is a religious view because we've had him on the program and you were our guest, if you remember, back to the Baha'i. They yes. said the exact same thing. This is known as religious syncretism in which you bring all of them together and say it's sort of a homogenization in which you say, well, uh, there's one big G, okay? And that one big G is the God of everybody, the supreme architect of nature. Hinduism. And does it make any difference whether it's Hindu, Buddhist, Muslim, Christian, Jewish? Now, that's masonry. But this is Christianity. Christianity says there is only one living and true God. He sent his son into the world to die for our sins. He rose from the dead. He is the only Savior. Now, that's the difference. That's what separates us from classic masonry, not from a Christian Masonic Lodge, not from a Christian Mason, but from masonry as a religion. Bill, does that, does that ring a bell that the very view that is the dog, dogma that we're starting with here, that belief and the fact that it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you believe in God, that is a religious view. I mean, do you understand that? Well, yeah, oh, sure, it's a religious view. And that's why we say we are religious, but not a religion. And, I, I, and you run into semantic differences here. I can religiously believe in skin diving. I can be religious in my belief of skin diving. Can I ask him a question at that point? Yeah, I think you better. Uh, how can you be honorable without, being, without having honor? It's, I, it's, it's, you can't. Guess you can't. You, 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 now, wait a minute. Let's go through that one again. I, oh, no, we're talking, <laughs> no, let's, I, let's talk about it. Let's talk the, about the right honorable person. No, but the I'm right saying, honorable. It's a title. No, no, no. I'm talking about the actual term itself. Uh, I say John is uh, Be careful. an honorable man. Okay. But John has no honor. Well, it's, you, you, know, you would look it, at me no, and you'd say, that's using, crazy. You're using the terms and in, I, interdependently, and they are not interdependent terms. Well, what about religion as I said, or religious? I, I, I can be religious. I can be religious as a Mason. Masonry can be religious but in it its belief of, of God. God but, but, of God. but to suppose, is Congress a religion because Congress opens every session with prayer? But it Which, incidentally, God. the prayer I read in the first program was, in fact, a prayer read before Congress. Did not invoke the name of Christ. It's a prayer. It's a prayer allowing us to proceed with God looking over us in our doings, the, and we're entitled well, the to The argument that. I just used on you is the argument, Coyle, your greatest authority on masonry Coyle's not uses. the greatest authority on masonry. Well, the, I don't know. Talk to your lodges they, outside of Idaho. They think he is. <laughs> no, it's, it's, he is an authority on masonry. There is no greatest authority on masonry. I, I don't let, know. Me, let me read from uh, Coyle right here at that point. Freemasonry certainly requires a belief in the existence of and a man's dependence upon a supreme being to whom he is responsible. What can a church add to that, Coyle asks? Uh, that's Coyle's opinion. I find my... Uh, I think that's pretty logical. Can you, can you tell me how you would differ? What does a church do that's differently than that? Uh, the, the church, in my particular case, I'm being a Christian, the Christians offers, uh, or as a Christian, the church offers me salvation, the belief in Christ. The, that's, uh, that's not something I get out of masonry. Masonry is not going to save me. Masonry is going to make me a better man. Masonry, uh, not that Christianity doesn't do the same thing, but, but I find in masonry the things that I want to find, the, the belief in the principles, the principles that this country was raised on. Sixty, or excuse me, uh, 32 of the 55 members of the First Continental Congress were Masons. You sat here on the first program with D. James Kennedy and representative with, uh, Buchanan discussing uh, Christianity and the government of this country. The only person that you quoted that first evening that wasn't a Mason was John Adams. Masonry, uh, there's a Masonic symbol on the dollar bill. There is, Masons are, are involved in almost half of our presidents. Which proves Masons. what? It's just, it proves that Masonry is involved in the construction of this country that has been prevalent in it. The very freedoms that we enjoy today came out of Masonic philosophy. No. Sorry about that. The uh, great freedoms, I'll argue that the great the, day the, ends. The great freedoms that we enjoy in this country today came out of 
moral and biblical principles enunciated by the deists and the theists, because the men that you are quoting as Masons were almost universally deistic, and they recognized the existence of a supreme being, theists or deists. They based it upon the Bible. That's why in the Constitution of the United States, it specifically states that it rests upon the Creator and nature's God, not nature and God the same, nature's God, and that we are endowed by our Creator with certain unalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This is part of the Constitution, was written in biblically based. The Bible antedates masonry. The Bible antedates masonry. Hey, we've got a question out here. I'd like to ask uh, Bill Mankin, as an ex 32nd degree Mason and Scottish Rite, I'd like to ask you, saved by the grace of God now, I've come out of it. I'd like to ask you a question. What would be your feelings toward me as a Christian, and what would be your feelings toward me as a Mason? Uh, that I'm, I'm sorry that you feel that, that, your, uh, that your Christian beliefs are incompatible with your Masonic beliefs, and I, and I think it's a great loss. And I think that the single, the single greatest enemy Masonry has today is is what I what I have to describe as a Christian new right, the 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 people who have who belie the tolerance of Christ, who for for different ideas for the fact that that we're not trying to be a religion, we're not trying to take the place of God, that, that's and there's nothing that you saw in Masonry that that should indicate that. Let, let me ask him wh why is it that you left your 32nd degree Mason? As uh, when I got saved and started reading the Word of God, it conflicted with everything Masonry had. To say. Can you give me one example? Well, uh, as a Christian now, uh, would be the swearing. You had to swear. And of course, I, you know, I went through uh, a lodge here in Chattanooga. And uh, that would be one thing. And of course, uh, being in there with people that don't even believe in a God at all. Well, as I said, there's, there's, nobody, there's nobody in my lodge, and I've never met a Mason. That, that did not believe in God, and I, and I don't know any Masons that are not Christians. I've heard them take the Lord's name in vain before. I've heard Christians take the Lord's name in vain. But you do admit it, it, that... Neither the, one of it's right. Yeah, that's no, correct. No. I, absolutely. There's no question. But Masonry does not bestow Godhood on a person. It's not going to... You can't say you're going to... Uh, as a Mason, it's, you're going... Uh, there is no system of salvation. This is not going to grant you salvation. It's Kennedy. not going to, and if you've read Kipling, you know that it's not particularly going to make you a better man. You're going to get into it, get out of it what you put into it. Can it bestow immortality in any way? Doesn't want to. When you have the funeral service and you commit people um, uh, as a, a mason, as a brother, you commit that individual to the great lodge in the sky. Symbolic. And the spirit... Dr. Martin, that is symbolic. What is it symbolic of? Yeah. It, is, it is symbolic of the belief of resurrection. Of who? That's one of the landmarks. Isn't that a belief, a religious belief? It's, uh, it is a symbolic belief. It is an it, allegorical well, belief. Well, is, is religion, now wait a minute, uh, uh, I'm confused here. Is, re is resurrection an actuality or is resurrection a symbol? Rex resurrection is an actuality. Right. But the, as it is portrayed in the Masonic funeral service, it is sim a, a symbolic. So they it's don't not, believe in resurrection? No. And th don't, don't change my words. I didn't I, say I, that. I, well, I'm just saying, if, if it, I asked you, first of all, if it was reality or symbol. You told me... In, resurrection in, exists. Okay. Now, now, you said to me, yes, for me, uh, it, it's, it's a reality. Now, how about for the Masons, for the Lodge, or for the funeral service, and so forth? And you said, well, it's symbolic. It is symbolic. Then it, they, as, then, as it deals with that particular aspect then, of the ritual. Then if it's symbolic, it isn't reality. It portrays... Uh, a, a concept. It is not man's right to grant resurrection. And what you're seeing is a symbolic... Is it holding out a hope of resurrection? I would think so. Is it a false hope? I oh, No. In terms of symbolism, no. In terms, in terms of, of, of the, the acting master in a, in a, uh, in a, in a Masonic funeral, he, he's not empowered to grant that resurrection. You're talking, you're dealing in symbols and nobody, Nobody's saying that, but the fact is that you are talking about that. Would anybody standing around in the Masonic Lodge get the idea that as being part of the Lodge, having the, the Masonic funeral, because we did all of this, because we had all this, because we followed the very tenets and symbolism of the Lodge, that the symbolism that I put into it, namely resurrection, the great Lodge in the sky, 
according to your Christian teachings, that's not how you get to heaven. According to, that is in fact. That's why I'm saying that this is in fact a symbolic act. Because uh, th there's no man so that you are, is going you to resurrect that, anybody. All right, so what you're saying is you have a symbolic act that you're holding on to that has no content. It has, it has content in its symbolism. It is uh, a system of allegory but nobody veiled, knows, nobody knows a system what it is. of morality veiled in allegory and illustrated by symbols. We, we've got to come back to that. So it means nothing again. It's just the it fact It is a symbol. It. it is symbol. It is a symbol. That's it. Does it stand for something? It, it's, it's symbolic in a ritualistic context. I think that's what religion is. I, I, I would argue that. I know you do, but I'm still <laughs> saying that I, I can't get away from the fact that when you say we are holding to this concept, you call it symbolism, and it has the word resurrection attached to it, and yet you won't put any content other than the fact of resurrection. Resurrection, by definition, means certain things. It's a religious view. And you're saying, but you won't tell people how to get there, and yet your Christian view, which does have content, says specifically, you don't get there just by hoping you'll get there. You don't get there just by holding it out to people. You need to tell them something, that you have to go to a Savior, namely Jesus Christ. That's the problem. Walter? I'd like to just quote a very famous theologian. Uh, suppose I should start an organization here in this church with secret work in several degrees. The first three degrees would eliminate the name of Jesus Christ and demand that every candidate confess a God named Geotu. We would accept Christians, Jews, Mohammedans, Buddhists, etc. After they had passed the first three degrees, we would say, now, if you Christians want to get together and confess your Christ, go up in a room by yourselves. You Mohammedans do the same and so forth, but don't drag your peculiar views into this third degrees. That is precisely what masonry does. What a pitiful sop to throw at the blessed Lord Jesus Christ. The quotation, there is nothing in it, masonry, to offend a Jew. Nothing in it to offend a Jew. The that's, Jew... That's McLean, isn't it? Yeah. Nothing... Uh, the quote was from the encyclopedia, nothing in it to offend a Jew. Um, what's interesting is that that important statement tells you everything offend. The scripture says that's what the gospel is. It's an offense. We're supposed to go outside the gate bearing the offense of the cross. We're supposed to take the cross and suffer as Christians bearing the fact that our Lord is the way, the truth, and the life. That's what we're supposed to do. And in masonry, there's nothing in it that will offend a Jew, a Muslim, a Zoroastrian, a Buddhist, or anybody else. It won't offend them at all. It's not compatible with Christianity because Christ, by definition, is offensive. Either he is Lord of all or he is not Lord at all. Okay, we got some more questions, and Bill, you can come back for a response. But let's take a break right here. Hold on, stick with us. We'll be right back. All right, we're back. We're talking with William Mankin from Boise, Idaho, a 32nd degree Mason. And we're also talking with Dr. Walter Martin, Christian professor founder of the Christian Research Institute. And we've got a question right here. Yes, in the next Bosé in Freemasonry, I read that when one attains this 32nd degree, they are told that God and Lucifer are one and the same. Is this true? Patently false. Dr. Martin. There are books in print, literature in circulation, which claim this. The Masons have steadfastly denied this for a very long time. And I have no reason to suppose that our brother is lying. And therefore, I would like to see more documentation rather than repeat something like that. Okay. In Oregon, let, let me jump into this. There is a, uh, a, an Episcopalian minister by the name retired of Clarence Kopp. He's 92 years old, still does work in Lodge. And Clarence Kopp wrote a definitive and gives, and is the one jurisdiction in the 32nd degree where he's still allowed to give this talk. And let me tell you that there isn't a person in this room that does not know and believe everything that is contained in the 32nd degree that I know of. Perhaps we can't talk about it, so I'm, I'm not sure how we can go okay. there. Let's question here. Uh, I was a master mason before I got saved. And uh, I would, as you know, if you are a master mason, and you know that, that uh, the master masons, from what I got out of it in the oath, that they promote fornication and adultery. Is that right? Not true. 
Absolutely. You want me to quote some of the oath you took and I took? No, that's no. it's not because it's in there. It uh, the, the I know the reference you're saying, and and that's one of the will nots, and that particular reference, uh, there's nothing that says uh, that you should go out and do it. It just says the the uh, the you obligation pertains to all people. It says you shouldn't do it if you know them to be so. Can I uh, can Walter, I quote something here? I don't know that they are. I think Walter's got the quote there. Uh, this has to do in the Master Mason's handbook, the chastity covenant of the Master Mason. Furthermore, I will not violate the chastity of a Master Mason's wife, mother, sister, or daughter, knowing them to be such. This gives you full permission, my dear sir, to do as you please outside of the Masonic order. But you must always respect the female relatives of Masons. It doesn't Close say quote. That. So what you're it doesn't say that anywhere in the obligation, Jack. It absolutely well, does not. Man, and that's yeah. preposterous. Yeah. This, is what this man said that he took. It forbids adultery with the chaste wife, mother, sister, or daughter of third degree Masons and above. Permits the Master Mason to commit adultery with the unchaste wife, mother, sister, or daughter of a Master Mason. <laughs> to, to ascribe that narrow a uh, uh, view to a solemn obligation. If you look at everything, it says the, uh, that you do that you treat your brethren to all mankind, it says, in virtually every aspect of every obligation. It doesn't say just, it says particularly your brethren in Freemasonry, but it also says that you treat everybody this way, and you do treat everybody. And anybody that truly lives Masonry is not going to go out and fornicate with somebody who just happens to not be related. Of course, that's what it said, isn't it? That's the problem. It's what it says. And it's not what it says. Well, I'm only quoting from the book. I mean, uh... That's not part of the ritual. Well, all right, that's that's what you understood it to mean, didn't you? Right. All right, so I don't know where we go from there. You have here in Tennessee. Well, I, I certainly did not uh, understand it to mean that when I took uh, an obligation that was very similar to what... Okay, let's let's get a 30-second uh, closing comment from each of you on this thing. Uh, do you still want to stick by your guns, Bill, that, uh, yep. that uh, you can have prayers, you can have the funeral services, you can talk about resurrection in a symbolic way, you can pray to the deity, you're commanded to pray to the deity, you're commanded to believe in a God, and that's not religious. We are no more religious than Congress that prays at the beginning of each of their meetings. I don't know if Congress demands that you believe in a deity, that you pray to it's, that it's, deity, that you hold to uh, a resurrection. Does Congress hold that? I, all I'm saying is that we are no more religious than that. I have to ask you to judge us by our works because you're not judging us by the content Walter, of what we say. Walter, final comment. We, uh, uh, just give me another second here. Okay. We do a lot. And who's going to speak for the kids when the people like Dr. Walter Martin say, uh, no more masonry, uh, don't be a mason. Who's going to take care, uh, who's going to spend the billion dollars that the Shriners have spent taking care of uh, orthopedic hospitals and burn children? Who's going to do it? Final comment. The Masonic Oaths, which our brother did not wish to discuss because he's under obligation not to, uh, call for the tearing out of the tongue, disemboweling, uh, all kinds of things to be done to the body if one betrays the oath sworn under obligation to God. Uh, and Christ has contradicted this flatly, chapter and verse in Matthew chapter 5. James confirms it in the fifth chapter of the epistle of James. The Christian gospel clearly states that our prime obligation is to the Lord Jesus Christ and the church which is his body, not to the lodge. We are told to come out from among that which is idolatry, and nothing could be more idolatrous than to be in the midst of people who spend their time acknowledging that Hinduism, Buddhism, Confucianism, and all the rest of the religions of the world, when they use the term God, are speaking about the God of the Bible. This is totally opposite to historic Christianity. All right, we're done for this week. We're going to have uh, one more week where we have questions from the audience. Please join us. Thank you. We're glad that you joined us. We're talking about the Masonic Lodge and Orthodox Christian belief. Are they compatible? And with me are two Christians on the platform, Mr. William Mankin from Boise, Idaho, Idaho, who happens to be a, I'll get it right, William Mankin from Boise, Idaho, who is a 32nd degree Mason in the lodge there, and then Dr. Walter Martin from the Christian Research Institute, who is also a professor of comparative religions at Simon Greenleaf School of Law. And I'd like to bring up, gentlemen, this week uh, 
a question to both of you. It seems like when we talk with some folks in the lodge that uh, they will admit that there are rituals, they will admit that there is symbolism. We can talk about resurrection at the funeral service, but it's symbolic. We can talk about the belief in one God. We can talk about the altar in the lodge. We can talk about all of these things, and yet, as symbols, uh, I hear you saying, Bill, that there is no content that uh, restricts a Christian in any way. There is nothing that conflicts with his Christian belief uh, concerning that. I'd like to bring up the fact that uh, here in the book, The Meaning of Masonry by W.L. Wilmshurst, who is quoted in the Encyclopedia Britannica as being one of the foremost authorities, especially on British uh, masonry. And this book now, uh, this last year, if I believe correctly, was put out by the Grand Lodge in New York. And they said this, as far as they are concerned, so we at least have one of the largest lodges, one of the key states in our country, saying that this is the meaning of those symbols. Now, in a couple programs, we've talked about the mysteries and the rituals. And I thought that uh, it'd be interesting to go back and see what this man says. What does he say those are tied to? Where does the meaning and the symbol fit together? He says, the relationship of modern masonry, masonry today, to the ancient mysteries, the mysteries of Egypt, and of Babylon, and so on, it is directly related. In other words, if we want to know the meaning of these symbols, you can find it in the mystery religions. And he has a whole book that goes through describing uh, the gods of Egypt, the gods of Babylon, and talking about the mystery religions as being the one that they're really talking about when they talk about this belief in the one supreme architect of the universe, which makes a lot of sense, Bill, because that God of the mystery religions, it was okay for the Jews and the Hindus and the Christians and the Muslims all to get together underneath their altars and to worship him. What would you say to this? This is not our literature now. This is the literature out of the lodge in New York City in our country saying that's the meaning of the symbols. Uh, it is hard for me to believe that that a square that is used to square a stone and a plum that is used to make uh, straight walls and a level that is used to try a horizontal plane can be terms or can be can be symbols that came out of the ancient mysteries. Uh, those are terms that builders, those are I, instruments that builds, builders have used for countless centuries to uh, erect walls. And masonry says erect your walls, erect your spiritual, and spirit meaning personal uh, life by using those tools as measurements. Walk uprightly. <clears throat> the plum admonishes us to walk uprightly in our several stations before God and man. Squaring our, squaring our actions by the square of virtue. And ever remember the thing that we are walking upon the level of time to that undiscovered country where no traveler ever returns. See, we use a little Shakespeare, too. Uh, that part of the ritual is, is uh, when you get into all of this other stuff, and that's all I can call it is stuff, you're dealing here again with opinion. You're dealing with, with uh, what somebody says. Okay. There's none of that in any Masonic ritual. Well, it's in the Lodge in New York because they published no, it. Th that book was published by the Lodge. They but must it does be, not, they must it's have published not, it because they believe it. You, don't, you won't hear that if you go into a lodge room. That's you won't they, hear any that, of that's that. That's why they said they published it. And that's yeah. the foreword of the book. Yeah. And it was the Grand Master who said that. Walter, uh, you are a professor of comparative <coughs> religions. Does this ring a bell uh, of what this man is saying in this book over here that we just quoted? Yeah, it, it rings a perfect bell in, in the mystery religions and in ancient religions because that is derived directly from the Kabbalah uh, and from their concept of the Sarafoth. And um, 
you could get yourself involved in discussions of this metaphysical Satanism for an awful long time because that's exactly what it is. What interests me, however, uh, is, uh, if I may use Shakespeare again, uh, this time, this above all to thine own self be true, and thou canst not be false to any man. Uh, you are a Scottish Rite Mason, and you can answer this one in the Scottish Rite, the 17th degree, or Knights of the East and West. Having completed the initiation after revealing the password, Jubulum, and the sacred word, Abaddon, the senior warden conducts the candidate to an elevated vacant canopy at the right of all of the all puissant. This is supposed to represent the end of the world and so forth. So the fourth seal is represented by a skull or a death's head. The fifth seal by a cloth stained with blood. The all puissant identifies this as a symbol that we should not hesitate to spill ours for the good of masonry. Close quote. It's all from the Scotch Rite and so forth. What interests me is that sacred word you've got there. The sacred word of this ritual which you went through as a Christian. Abaddon. That sacred word is found in Revelation 9 and 11. He is the angel of the bottomless pit. He is a demon. And when you went through that rite... I didn't go through that rite. That was another one that was not uh, exemplified. Okay. I'm, beginning to say well, I'm glad you didn't. But <laughs> when a mason of the Scottish rite to which you belong goes through it, he is invoking Beelzebub, prince of demons. Well, that is I've, evil. I would have to look into that a little bit more. I'd well, I suggest you do. May I give you the reference? Scottish Rite Masonry Illustrated, Ritual, Volume 1, pages 453, 56, 57, E. Cook Publishing, 1974. I got one more for you, though, here, and that is the fact of uh, on all the Masonic uh, seals and so on, I think you have the all seeing eye. What is the source of that symbol and its meaning? Uh, that, is, that is, in fact, a, another symbol. That, that What's the meaning? It came out of Egypt, but it, the meaning is the deity. It's, I'm glad you said God. that because I have the Masonic Bible, and here it says, which knocks me out, Walter, here is uh, King James Bible with this preface in the front. What is the all-seeing eye? It's an important symbol borrowed by the Freemasons from the nations of antiquity. Among the in Egyptians, Osiris, their chief deity, was symbolized by an open eye. Now, uh, that doesn't mean to say that that holds true today. What it says right here. It's, it it's, it's by the to, to, to assume that Masons are, are are praying to Osiris is ridiculous. It is that is they're again patently ridiculous. It's not I, the case. The all-seeing eye represents the deity. It represents God. It fits, doesn't it? It represents uh, it, it represents the same. If you look on the dollar bill, you'll see it on every dollar bill that you ever have. It's there at the top of the pyramid. It represents God, the same God in God we trust. Walter, I agree that symbols can change their meaning. Christmas, December 25th, uh, was a pagan feast day taken over by the Christian church. So was Easter, uh, the goddess Estes. Uh, your objection is valid on that basis. I wouldn't make my objection on that basis. If I were going to make my objection following John through, uh, I think I would uh, make my objection quite the opposite. I would object strenuously to the paganism that is in there in, for instance, the temple in... Los Angeles, which I took the trouble to visit, where there is a statue of Moses, and then there is a statue of Zoroaster, and then there is a statue of uh, uh, Osiris, and there is a statue of Thoth, and there is a statue of Egyptian gods and goddesses. Now, my objection would be based upon this, that when you put the representative of the God of the Bible in the midst of the pagan world which God judged for its evil, condemned it as vile, depraved, and wicked, then I think that you have gone over the borderline of just symbol. You're playing with very dangerous spiritual fire. For instance, in the book of Exodus, with which you're familiar as a Christian, you know that when God finally wrapped up the whole plague bit with Moses, the last one was the execution of his judgment upon the firstborn of the house of Egypt. If you read that in the Hebrew, it's quite significant. He said, I will pass through the land of Egypt tonight, and I will execute judgment, vengeance. It's quite significant. On the gods of Egypt.
for I am the eternal God. Now here in masonry, you've got all of this pagan gobbledygook, which was condemned by our God and by his Son and by his Spirit, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, sitting up there, and you are in the midst of it as a Christian. That, to me, is totally incongruous with 2 Corinthians. Come out from among them, the idols, and be separate, saith the Lord, and I will be your God, and you will be my people. The other thing going right with that would be the fact that as a Christian in the Masonic Lodge, if you have brothers that are teaching this statement that I'm going to read to you, you ought to advocate that, number one, as a Mason, you don't have to hold that, and that they should quit saying that and burn this book. For example, this is a quote out of probably the book that is in every Masonic home from here to Timbuktu. And it's in a quote on page 226, and I'll give you the book in a moment. Masonry around whose altars the Christian, the Hebrew, the Muslim, the Brahmin, the followers of Confucius and Zoroaster can assemble as brethren and unite in prayer to the one God who is above all the Balaam must needs leave it to each of its initiates to look for the foundation of his faith and hope to the written scriptures of his own religion. Professor, let me ask you a question about a word there that throws everybody off. What in the world is this word Balaam doing in there when it says, unite in prayer to the one God who is above all the Balaam? What does that mean in comparative religion? Simply, in, in their context, it refers to gods. Okay, the false gods is what it means. Yeah. And at that point, it is saying that the false gods are those of the Christian, the Hebrew, the Muslim, the Brahmin, the follower of Confucius and Zoroaster, and there's one above all of them that we're really praying to. That's the Kabbalah. That's the Kabbalah, which is advocated in the next paragraph, and this is found in Albert Pike's book, World page Kabbalah. 226, which I think is in probably more homes in our country, even in our Christian homes, Dr. Martin, I believe that book sits there, and it's advocating a view that is diametrically opposed to what they believe as Christians. I think that was republished in 1948, too. Yeah, it's... Well, let's take a break, and we'll talk about this more in just one moment. Stay with us. We're back, and our guests are William Mankin, 32nd degree Mason, out in Boise, Idaho, who's also a Christian. And on the other side, Dr. Walter Martin from the Christian Research Institute. We're talking about, is Christianity compatible with uh, the thoughts and teachings, ideas, concepts of the Masonic Lodge? And we have a question, gentlemen. Yes, Mr. Mack, and I was uh, listening to what you said maybe in one of the earlier shows about that, uh, how y'all help widows and orphans and stuff like that. How come, as the Bible teaches explicitly about us as Christians through the local church to help widows and keep up the orphans, how come you need to go through another organization to do this? Uh, the Widows and Orphans Fund is, is internal and is a very, very small part of masonry. What I was talking about earlier was the charities that, uh, uh, that the shrine does. For example, the 18 shrine orthopedic hospitals, the three uh, shrine burn clinics, the uh, 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 Scottish Rite has the aphasia clinic, the uh, uh, York Rite has... Uh, a charity that is uh, each of the each of the bodies has a separate charity. The uh, Royal Arch has a, a separate charity. The uh, Cryptic Masons have a separate charity. The uh, Knights Templar have a separate charity, and I and I can't give them to your right hand what they are. But th we do sponsor these things. And what I'm saying is that if you eliminate us, that nobody is going to take care of us. I don't see anybody running forth willing to take over the operation of the uh, but, uh, shrine. Why, why do you the say budget was $162 million this year. Is that the only way you can do it, though, that if the Christians that are in all those lodges dropped out, would they have to stop giving to those charities? Well, in the United States, they would. Well, couldn't they form I, their own? Well, sure, but who's going to do When we do, do something it? through the churches? Who, who is going to do it, John? Who's going to do it? How about the churches? Uh, the, the, the churches haven't done that well in, in the past two or three years. With, uh, uh, we've but got a larger poverty problem now than we've had in, in heaven knows how long. Yeah, Walter, you see the motivation? We're, we're getting a feel to this, and that's, that's not really the issue. The issue is, I have to say, since you're unwilling to look at the, the, the concepts of Freemasonry in terms of, of what it really is, the square, the compasses, 
I'm not and, afraid to look at it. I'm, I'm just afraid that we can't agree that there's any authority to define those symbols. I've defined the symbols. And uh, I'm saying that uh, you say you won't accept those authority that comes right out of your main lodge no, in New York. I, I, all I'm saying is that the all-seeing eye is not necessarily the one symbol for which you to judge masonry. But you mind. know what? It was interesting that you came up with the idea that that came out of Egypt before I ever said anything. Well, because it, it says, you know, it's, there's no question it came out of Egypt. John. It okay. was there. I think there's a motivation in masonry as there is in the entire cultic structure that we study in the kingdom of the cults. Quote, human nature is perfectible by an intensive process of purification and initiation. That's the uh, Masonic initiation. Good works is the pathway to salvation in That's all awesome. pagan religions and the pathway to justification. And not for Christians. Maybe not for Christian Lodge. Not but even very for definitely Masons. but very definitely the Masonic Order holds that the works which one performs, the things that one does, are part of balancing the books before the great architect of nature. That's not true. Which is quite di well that's all in all no, the what books. We're, what we're saying is don't judge you have to judge us on something. You have to judge us judge us on the basis of what we do and not what you think we are or yeah. what somebody has written right. about us. Okay, let's, let's put it this way. The Mormon church is bigger than you are, more powerful than you are, has more money than you do, I'll say. has more missionaries, has a fantastic income, the people are moral, ethical, kind, gracious, thrifty, they're oh, hardworking, they care about their neighbors and all the rest of it, right? Why shouldn't we turn around and say, look at all those good works. Don't judge them by their theology. Judge them by their works. You won't do that. You've just called them polytheists. Well, I'm not going to judge masonry by that either. I'm going to judge it by its theology as well as by its works. We have no theology. Oh, yes, you do. Here's, very here's, the thing theology. That, here's another thing. Is If we had Albert Pike resurrected and had him sitting in the chair saying what he wrote in his book, or if we took the five men that have come out with encyclopedias on Freemasonry promoted by some of your main lodges in this country sitting here, they would say absolutely every one of those things is what they believe as Masons. And they would say that you out there in Idaho, you haven't just caught up. You're, you're provincial. You've got a long ways to go. That and you have not be. learned the real symbols of the Masonic Lodge. And probably it's because your Christian faith is cutting in on that. That may very well be. Or if is. you were to come back and you take a look at Albert Pike who says, the blue degrees, which is what you wanted to discuss, are but the outer quarter portico of the temple. That's the lodge. Part of the symbols are displayed there to the initiate, but he is intentionally misled by false interpretations. It is not intended that he shall understand them, but it is intended that he shall imagine he understands them. Is that you, Bill? No, that's what he's describing there is the legend of the third degree, or the first, second, and third degree, where this all takes place in King Solomon's temple. There's, there, you are told that, but it, it is a Masonic legend. We can't really suppose that there were really Masons at, at the building of King Solomon's temple. King Solomon's, King Solomon's temple was built largely by conscripts. Uh, it says you're intentionally misled by yeah, false interpretations. It, it, it's, but that's, uh, that's an oversimplification. The fact is, what you're saying is that, that we have an allegory here. And an the real allegory. allegory has not been told them at those degrees. It's and not intended that he shall understand them. It's intended that he shall imagine he understands them. That's, uh, there again, that's, that's what he says. That's not, that's not what I would say. What I would say is, is you go into the deeper meanings of the degrees, and you read, and you put into it, and you will get out of it. I'm you reminded, will find it. I'm reminded of the words of Scripture, which says, The stone which the Masons rejected has become the head of the corner. And masonry rejects, except for Christian lodges, the claims of Jesus Christ and the absolute authority of the scriptures. It talks about the light of the Bible. They're in the dark because they don't use the Bible. It's not binding upon them to live by biblical authority. And what we are dealing with is a non-Christian cult with a lot of very nice people in it who are very sincere and very dedicated but very mistaken. In the words of Scripture, there is a ray that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. I had a, a fabulous quotation here about uh, 30 seconds long, John, if I could read it, to close my remarks on this particular point. It comes from a non-denominational evangelist, the greatest of the 19th century. 
Therefore, it can't be prejudiced as far as denominational views are concerned. He said, quote, I do not see how any Christian, most of all a Christian minister, can go into these secret lodges with unbelievers. They say they can have more influence for good, but I say they can have more influence for good by staying out of them and then reproving their evil deeds. You can never reform anything by unequally yoking yourself with ungodly men. True reformers separate themselves from the world. But, some say to me, if you talk that way, you will drive all the members of secret societies out of your meetings and out of your churches. But what if I did? Better men will take their places. Give them the truth anyway, and if they would rather leave their churches than their lodges, the sooner they get out of the churches, the better. I would rather have ten members who are separated from the world than a thousand such members. Come out from the lodge, better one with God than a thousand without him. We must walk with God, and, only, and if only one or two go with us, it is all right. Do not let down the standard to suit men who love their secret lodges or have some darling sin they will not give up. Close quote. Dwight Lyman Moody. The defense rests. <laughs> Listen, I want to say thank you to both of you, and especially uh, to you, Bill, for coming from Boise and uh, being on the hot seat with us. I know that uh, it's been rugged, and also, Walter, for you to uh, speak out on this. I'm sure that uh, it stirred some controversy uh, out in television land. Thank you for at least considering the evidence from both sides. Thank you, and hope you'll see us next week. Mm -hmm.